Hello everyone, this is Dr. Stevens, and I'd like to give you some help with reading Bartleby the Scrivener by Herman Melville. So we're going to use some of those approaches or techniques, if you will, that uh, we read about in Thomas Foster's How to Read Literature Like a Professor. Uh, in particular, we're going to look at the idea of a character or characters in a story being a Christ figure that is in some way similar to the figure of Jesus Christ in Christianity. We're going to look at the whole idea of geography, or we might call the physical aspect of setting, where a story takes place. And then finally, we're going to look at physical characteristics, especially outstanding physical markings of a character. But um, a few words before we actually look at that. First of all, why I am t choosing those three approaches. Now, there are lots of ways that you can approach interpretation of a work of literature. And remember this principle that there is always more than one interpretation of a work. This does not mean that every interpretation is right. It doesn't mean that just because you've got an opinion or I've got an opinion about a story that that's a good opinion. But the idea is simply that there is more than one possible interpretation. Not all interpretations are good ones, but there is more than one good interpretation. Okay, so the idea is, I've got this story here, Bartleby the Scrivener. It's not a particularly easy story to interpret, so I'm looking around for ways to interpret it. Um, I look at Foster, and I say, okay. Now, I did not choose this story in order to illustrate the use of the Christ figure or in order to illustrate the use of physical markings or geography. That's not it at all. I've got the story. I begin with the story and I say, okay, now what's my best way into this story, right? You may, if you, if you saw my uh, remarks about a wife's story, you re might remember my little metaphor of the doors, all right? These different um, ways of looking at a work of literature that Foster offers us are like doors into the story. How do we get into it so we can see what's really there, right? So we're walking down the hall and we see all these doors and one door is marked Christ figure. We open that door, all right? And we look inside and we say, okay, well, maybe, maybe this will work for me, all right? And another door is called symbolism, say. Okay, so I open that door and I say, well, yeah, maybe it'll work, but I, you know, symbols, symbols in this story don't really jump out at me. I'm, I'm going to try another door. So we go down a little farther and we find a door called oh, geography. And I say, my goodness, you know, in this story, there's an awful lot of attention paid to the location, to descriptions of where this story is taking place. Aha, I think I'll go into this room this room called geography and see if it works for this story. Remember that. <clears throat> no one work of literature has one door that works for that work of literature, right? At the same time, no work of literature is going to be open, as it were, to all of those doors. Some are going to work better than others. That's the way interpretation is. And this is one of the reasons that Foster gives you what he gives. It's, it's like a whole list of different ways of looking at it. Let's look at it in terms of the Bible. Let's see if there are some similarities to Shakespeare. Let's see if there is some kind of political understanding of this story that will help unpack it for us and so on. That's what, that's what Foster is giving you, right? He's saying, Okay, there's always more to a work of literature than just what we read on the surface. Let's find out what are some of the ways that we can discover what that meaning is, interpretation. Okay, so talk a little bit about the story itself. Herman Melville, famous for one of the most famous novels ever written, Moby Dick, 
about the hunt for the white whale by Nantucket whalers. Okay, uh, so you're probably familiar at least with the name of that book if you haven't actually read the book or seen one of the movies or know the story. Okay, so by Herman Melville, a 19th century American writer. Um, I want to just go over the surface of the story for you just to point out what's happening, what are the main features of the story. The story is called Bartleby the Scrivener. That tells you that in some sense he is the main character. The story is a first-person narrative, all right? Meaning that one of the characters in the story is telling us the story from his point of view. He's using the first person, I, me, right? Okay, so, and that character is a lawyer. He is a Wall Street lawyer, all right? He has a law practice. He employs various people in his practice to help him with his work, okay? And he is telling the story. And at the time that he's telling the story, he tells us he's a fairly elderly man. I don't think that he tells us whether or not he's retired, all right, but he's a fairly elderly man. Now, he employs um, two different kinds of people. He employs an office boy named Ginger Nut. All right, he employs scriveners. Now, a scrivener is simply somebody who copies documents. You've got law documents. You draw up a law document, say a title to land, right? Something like that or you draw up a brief for some kind of case in court, whatever it might be. Now, we're talking about the 19th century. There's no Xerox, right? There are no copy machines, okay? So what are you going to do when you need a copy of a document? Somebody's got to write it out by hand. And so in the law profession, before the age of copy machines, there were people who before the typewriter would actually write things by hand. And then, of course, when the typewriter came along and we had carbon paper, I don't know if you remember carbon paper, but there were, then the typewriter could make various copies and so on. But before that time, before the typewriter, people would actually have to copy things by hand. That's what a scrivener was. And these people are law scriveners. So our lawyer, and he doesn't tell us our name, but our lawyer who was telling us the story has a lot of business, so he decides to hire an additional. He already has two, all right? He has Turkey and Nippers are his two scriveners. He needs a third, so he hires Bartleby, all right? So Bartleby copies documents for him. But the lawyer very early finds out that Bartleby refuses to do anything else. And his signature response, whenever Bartleby is asked to do anything, is, I'd prefer not to. Okay, that's a very, very important detail, obviously, and I'm sure that it's one that you picked up on when you read the story. That is the central problem that the story deals with. How is the lawyer going to deal with a, an employee who, except for copying something, refuses to do anything else. And eventually, he refuses even to copy. All right? So that's what the story is about. How are we going to deal with this employee who won't do what he's told, basically? And we discover that the lawyer, for a variety of reasons, cannot get rid of Bartleby. He tries... He, he tries to, to uh, I mean, fire him is kind of a strong word. He tries to sort of sever relationships with Bartleby. He offers him various generous offers for leaving his service and so on. And Bartleby refuses not only to leave the lawyer's employment, he refuses to leave the premises. That's extremely important. He stays there. He is not going to go away. And eventually then the lawyer figures the only way I'm going to be able to separate myself from this individual, he won't leave my premises, then I'm going to have to leave my premises. He does leave the premises. Bartleby stays. The next tenant can't get rid of Bartleby 
either. So they bring the lawyer in. The lawyer still fails to get Bartleby to leave. Eventually, they call the police. Bartleby is hauled off to prison, and that is where Bartleby dies in the end. He dies in prison. That's the story. Let's look at these approaches now. I want you to make a choice in, in, in the assignments in Unit 3. I'm asking you to choose one of three approaches, and I've already mentioned them. And so we're going to look very, very quickly at how you might um, deal with those approaches. So let's do that. Um, the Christ figure, the geography, and physical characteristics. I'm going to start with geography. And what I mean by geography here is simply location, where the story takes place. Some stories pay a great deal of attention to this. Other stories pay less attention. But where a story takes place, according to Foster, can signify a lot about what that story means. So, if you go to the text of the story itself, and I encourage you to do that. Put this video on pause. If you haven't uh, gotten out your copy of the story already, then please do so, so we can, we can look at it. And we're going to go in terms of paragraphs. Fairly long story, I think it's over 200 paragraphs, but they are in the text that we are using numbered, so we can, we can use paragraphs to find our way around. So physical location, what are we talking about? In paragraph five, fifth paragraph of the story, our narrator, the lawyer, describes his chambers, as he calls them. These would be his law offices. We don't use that word chambers anymore, but that was at the time a common phrase for uh, referring to somebody's offices. So his law offices, he says, are on the second floor of a building. Now he's on Wall Street, the center of um, business in New York City, right? So he is uh, in these offices on the second floor. I want you to look for details. I'm not going to go over all the details. There are quite a few details of setting here in the story, but I just want to give you an example of the kinds of things I'm talking about. In paragraph five, the lawyer tells us about a window at one end of his offices that look on a white wall. And this is the wall of a spacious skylight shaft in building complexes. This is one of the ways of bringing light into a large building is simply to build a shaft right into the building and the light comes down the shaft. At the other end of the offices, in contrast, is a black brick wall. And this brick wall, which is very close, I can't remember exactly the distance, but something like three feet outside this window, right? This brick wall gives the appearance of the offices being next to a huge square cistern. Okay, I don't know if you're familiar with that word, but a cistern is a place that holds water, all right? Um, not a well. In a well, things, water tends to come and go. It rises up from the ground and so on, but a cistern is static water. So these are the kinds of, of details I want you to look at. Now we can, let's see. Um, well, some additional details in paragraph 17, and this is after the lawyer has hired Bartleby. He tells us that his offices are divided by ground glass folding doors that he can use to separate his part of the office from that part in which the scriveners work. Now, ground glass is opaque. You can't see through it. All right. It's glass that has a rough matted surface. So that is a detail that I think could be quite important, right? Um, he talks about putting Bartleby's desk next to a small side window that 
has no view at all. All right, it looks directly onto a wall. All right, there is there is nothing to see other than this wall, and there is light that comes from above, but that's it. And then also another detail that you might consider if you choose this particular approach is look at that green folding screen that the lawyer sets up um, for this between himself and the space where Bartleby is working. And he's, he tells us that he sets this up so that he and Bartleby don't have to see each other. In other words, there's a certain amount of privacy, but he can communicate by voice. That is, Bartleby can hear him, whereas presumably if those glass doors are closed, the scriveners who are on the other side, far enough away and so on, wouldn't be able to hear him as well. Now, these are the kinds of details that I'm asking you to look at. I'm not going to tell you how to interpret them, but two points. First of all, I'm not giving you an inclusive list. I mean, there are more details. I'm just giving you examples of the kinds of things that I think you ought to look at. And I encourage you to look through the entire story and come up with other details of your own. And secondly, as I say, I'm not going to interpret these details for you, but I would like to suggest something. When you talk about windows, what do windows signify, right? They signify being able to look out into other spaces, right? To go beyond the space where you are, okay? So think, think in terms of windows and what windows signify then. Put a wall outside that window, and, and if you have any familiarity with life in a city and buildings in cities, you certainly are familiar with windows that just look out onto the wall of another building or something. What does that suggest when you put a wall right up next to a window? Bartleby's small side window, for example, he can't see anything except a wall that's right out there and so on. So you get this sense of Bartleby occupying an enclosed space, a space that has windows that ought to look out into something, but don't really because all of these windows, none of these windows has really a view at all. What does that signify? Okay, geography. Those are the kinds of details you want to look at, and those are the kinds of questions you want to ask. We've got walls, okay? The writer Melville and the narrator mentions walls, okay? It's not an accident that they mention walls. Windows, they mention windows. It's not an accident that they mention windows. These are not purely incidental things. It's not an accident that there are glass doors that can be open and shut. And it's certainly not an accident that the glass is ground glass. That is, it has a surface that you can't see through. Physical characteristics. Let's look at that. So, Bartleby's characteristics, I'm looking uh, again just as at examples. In paragraphs 15 and 16, and this is where Bartleby is introduced. And again, this is not an inclusive list that includes everything that uh, all the descriptions, all of the physical characteristics of Bartleby, but notice, all right? Bartleby is described, first of all, as being motionless. He is a motionless young man. Think about the significance, the meaning, the symbolism, if you will, of motion and motionless. This guy is not a basketball player, is he, right? He's not somebody who knows how to move around and is physically active, he is motionless. He's a young man, he is pallidly neat, pallid meaning pale in complexion. He is pitiably respectable. He is neat, but his neatness is pale. He is respectable, but his respectable, his, his respectability attracts our pity. It is pitiable, and so on. Physical characteristics. 
he is singularly sedate, all right? Meaning he is very composed, dignified, and so on. All right, what do these characteristics then suggest thematically or symbolically about Bartleby and about the situation he is in? What do they say about um, his persistent refusal to do any work? And notice that Bartleby's refusal to obey orders is not an active rebellion. He does not get angry. He does not start spouting rhetoric about workers' rights and what I'm going to do and what I won't do and that sort of thing. No, he's very, very quiet. He simply says, I prefer not to, goes back to work, and look at the way people respond. They don't do anything, right? The lawyer doesn't do anything. The lawyer can't figure out how to get around this very, very passive resistance, if you will. Okay, so I'm asking you, that's not a complete list of, of Bartleby's uh, physical characteristics, but if you choose this approach, that's what I'm asking you to do. Look at the physical characteristics and ask yourself, how does this help me understand this story better? All right, and if it doesn't, then move on to another approach. And I'm offering as a third approach, the Christ figure. Now, this is a little bit more complicated. What, it, what the approach asks you to do is to take the character of Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ of the New Testament, the Jesus Christ of, of Christianity, who lived um, in what is now Israel back in uh, 2,000 years ago and was crucified and so on, all right? Walked around did some teaching, did some, some healing, fed people, talked to people, and so on, right? Okay, so what the approach asks you to do then is to take that figure of Jesus Christ to make yourself aware of the characteristics of Jesus Christ and then compare the character, the main character in the story with Jesus. Is there some kind of comparison then? That helps you perhaps understand the character in the story and through understanding the character then to be able to interpret the story more fully. So what kinds of characteristics are we talking about? All right, Foster, and let me see if I can remember the page because here's a reference for you and I think it's page one, yeah, page 119. All right, and I certainly encourage you to, um, to go back to that chapter, yes, she's a Christ figure too. And by the way, I, I, I'm assuming that you will have read these three chapters on the Christ figure geography and um, the one on physical characteristics uh, is something like uh, he's marked for a reason. Is that? Let me see. <laughs> I sometimes get these... Um, uh, la, 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 la. Oh, marked for greatness. I'm sorry. Chapter 21, marked for greatness. Chapter 19, geography matters. And then chapter 14, she's a Christ figure too. I'm assuming you have read these. I do not expect you to be able to answer these questions um, without reading them. And I encourage you to review uh, the chapters as you feel you need to. But in the chapter on the Christ figure, on page 119, Foster gives you a convenient list. All right, so um, his first characteristic, and, and these are not in any particular order of importance, right, necessarily, uh, but he is crucified. He has wounds in the hands, feet, side, and head. Characteristic two, he suffers agony. Characteristic three, Christ is self-sacrificing. Characteristic four, he's good with children, right? Characteristic five, he's good with loaves, fishes, water, and wine, all right? References to the miracles that Jesus performs with those items, all right? But also a reference to the fact that Jesus fed people and so on. Now, folks, when you compare a character in a story with Jesus Christ, you don't want to be 
too exact or to or expect an exact one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence between Jesus's characteristics and the characters characteristics. Bartleby, for example, if you choose to compare Bartleby, and that's certainly what this particular assignment, this question, is asking you to do, all right? I mean, the question being, does the idea of a Christ figure help you understand the story better? It's not asking you to find one-to-one uh, -one correspondences or exact correspondences between Bartleby and Christ, all right? But it's looking for general similarities. So, the first characteristic that um, Foster mentions, crucified with wounds and hands, feet, and so on, all right? Well, the idea would not be to look at Bartleby and say, mm -mm, no, Bartleby wasn't crucified, so no, he's not a Christ figure. The idea would be to look at ways in which he might be physically marked in the same general sense, marked as a form of punishment, perhaps, wounded, for some particular reason, and so on. Um, in agony, second characteristic that Foster lists. No, you're not being asked whether Bartleby suffers agony the same way Jesus Christ does, and, and Jesus' agony takes various forms. Agony on the cross of feeling that he's been abandoned by his father, for example. That's one, one form his agony takes. But the idea is to look at any possible agony that Bartleby might be experiencing. Is his agony in some general way similar to the agony of Jesus Christ? Um, let's see. Okay, that particular list on 119 uh, has a total of 18 items. Um, so I'll invite you to look at those. And let's see, there's another shorter list on page 122, but it's very similar, I think, to, to the list on 119. Anyway, if you choose to uh, look at Bartleby as a Christ figure, that would be the kind of thing you're doing. Okay? Think of Jesus Christ, what you know about Jesus Christ. Um, Make a list of characteristics that seem significant to you. Look at the character of Bartleby. See if there are some similar characteristics. Look at Bartleby's characteristics. Make a list of what he is like. Then take your list and, and apply it to Jesus Christ and see if there are some similarities there. All right. So Bartleby the Scrivener. The central question then is, what are we to make of Bartleby himself? Why does he refuse to, um, ultimately refuse to do any work? I prefer not to. Why does he keep saying that? What does that mean? And can one of these three approaches help us understand that? Thanks for listening, folks. And I look forward to seeing what you have to say about Bartleby the Scrivener.